to the team from Clarice today, who's going to talk about who's going to talk about uh, Farmaker and Connect. It's uh, Rosemary uh, who's going to be sending a lot of stuff on the on Slack with links of the blogs and the various information I talk about. Ronnie Rios and myself, Doug Wallace. I am the uh, product manager for the Farmaker side at Clarice. Uh, so we're going to talk about Clarice Farmaker 2023, uh, what we've done around it, what we are trying to get out of it, uh, some of the, work, the, the the new features and enhancement that we actually brought into Clarice Farmaker 2023 to give you a sort of an idea of, of what we've done, where we're going, and why we're actually sort of doing some of the work that we're doing this way. So essentially, the work that's been done on Farmaker 2023 is around the performance and scalability of uh, the platform. Uh, when we started doing Farmaker 19, what we were really trying to do was to actually make sure that Farmaker could be seen as a very open platform. So for people that have been in Farmaker for a long time, it's kind of clear that you can actually get data from the outside easily into Farmaker and data from Farmaker can easy, be, easily be used with systems that actually live outside the Farmaker platform. But we were trying to make it easier for people from that never knew Farmaker to be able to actually sort of use the platform at a higher level. So with Farmaker 19, we introduced the JavaScript uh, integration inside the FileMaker. We increased the way, the, 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 the way that you could leverage the data API or, or data. And so we're really trying to actually sort of make this uh, all work together so that people can actually use FileMaker inside the company easily. And so we've been really improving basically the stability of the system, but as well the, um, scalability to be able to actually have more users. We know that a lot of time companies, whether they are in-house developers or partners working with other companies, in a lot of cases, they'll start small and eventually the application will go to a level that's kind of uh, gets pretty high. And we wanna make sure that they can actually keep on using it, uh, even though the amount of users actually um, work on that front. The other thing that we wanna do as well is we wanna make sure that whenever we do any work on making FileMaker performant, we are doing it both for small usage and high usage. And so when I go through the slides on WebDirect, there's a lot of work we've done on Parmaker WebDirect to make it uh, able to be used with more customers and more users on one server, but as well as making more uh, stable for low users uh, as well uh, as high users. Uh, so this is a, a kind of quote from Joshua Armand that everyone knows. Uh, we've had a lot of those basically, a lot of good feedback from the community saying they really sort of uh, appreciate the work that we've done on the Farmaker platform. And it was really nice to actually see that we fixed a lot of, of issue, uh, of bugs that have been there for a long time uh, that we've tried to be able to fix as quickly as we can. So first off, we're gonna go through Claris Farmaker Pro, then we'll talk about Claris Farmaker Server, and then Ronnie will talk about Claris Connect. Uh, so in the Farmaker Pro world, one of the main feature that we, we added with the launch of Farmaker 2023 was a new script trigger called on window transaction. Uh, so with uh, the later version of 19, we introduced uh, script transactions. So there's three new script steps that allow developer to have a bit more control over how transaction are being controlled by the developer. So previously transaction was environment that was completely closed, basically the developers, they had to trust everything that Farmaker was, was doing for them. And there was no way for them to actually pause a transaction or verify some information between committing a transaction. Uh, and while we were doing this work, uh, um, we came out actually, I should say Clemacale came out with this notion that we could actually grab some information when a transaction is actually happening so that we can give out some information to the developer. Uh, so what we decided to do was actually create a new script trigger which essentially is gonna grab uh, a JSON object uh, whenever a transaction occurs on the window. Um, the information that we grab is kind of straightforward. We grab a basically a couple of a bit of information. And then the idea behind it is just to give you the basic tools so that on top of it, you can grab any type of data. So essentially what we bring back into that JSON uh, payload is we'll give you the, the name of the file the base table uh, name of the table that you basically, the uh, transaction is occurring, will give you the operation that actually happens. So it could be new, deleted, or modified, the record ID, and then after that, a field 
uh, that could be contain anything. So it could be a calculation field. It could be just one field with just one piece of data. That's where basically you as a developer will decide what type of inf information you want to install. So the example that I've got on my screen, you basically grab the default field that basically gets created in a table and we basically put them inside uh, one bit of information. And with that, you can do pretty much whatever you want to do. So I'm going to do a quick demo of, of what we've built. Uh, we've created a blog entry on our engineering blog that actually goes through an example of how you can use on with transaction. There's a lot out there of the developers that have created some great solutions. And so without being perspective, we're just going to give you an idea of what can be done with it. Uh, so I'm just going to share my the whole screen. Uh, so I've got a FileMaker 2020 file. This is a demo file. It has a couple of fields, normal ones, a text field, number field, a date field, time, timestamp, and container. And uh, what I've got on, on side of it is a JSON file that basically is going to show you whenever I make a change to uh, my demo file, it's going to create uh, inside my JSON file a new, uh, it's going to insert a bit of JSON payload of information that I'm tracking. So what we did in the background is we created a custom function that essentially uh, is grabbing the data before we actually do the transaction. So it's grabbing, it's doing a calculation to grab all the fields in, uh, in my table and to grab the original value in that table before I do any changes. All this information is on the blog, but you can easily create it. So it's basically like four custom function to create uh, and then a quick uh, calculation inside the table that you want to track. And that's pretty much it. So I've got this audit log, which is basically grabbing all this installed information and it's grabbing all the information from those fields uh, when I do the change. So if I create a new record, randomly, it's going to basically populate the information. And in the JSON, as you can see, it's filling in information. So this is the file name, this is the best net table name, where well, uh, the option occurs, the record ID. And then all of this is what I created in my calculation. So it's giving me what was there before uh, and then all the changes that I did with her. In that case, it's a new entry. So there was nothing before it. It got changed. If I modify this to one, two, three, this will basically get refreshed. And then this will go uh, at the bottom of the page. Uh, and this is basically giving me the information. So after that, it's really up to you to decide whatever type of information uh, you want to do. Uh, this new script trigger works both in fine mode and browse mode. So you might want to basically set up a system that you only track the finds that you want to do, or you only track the browse and, and those like this. A couple of things to be careful about is the, the amount of information that she is being returned depends on you. So it could be quite long. So this is like 60 lines. It's basically going to be about five to 10 K. So if you do a lot of changes, obviously a lot of information is going to be grabbed in. One of the things that we kind of say to people is if you're going to use it to be able to do audit tracking, don't save the information in the same file like a file that you're doing it because when you do a transaction, if you write stuff, you can go into a weird loop. So either save this in a completely separate system or, I mean, you can do whatever, but uh, don't save it as the same file that you're doing your transaction. Otherwise, it can go into a weird loop. Uh, to make it easier for you as well, we added a couple of new functions uh, for you to be able to actually really do a great sort of uh, audit logging system. So we basically give you functions to be able to grab uh, all the base table names, all the base table IDs, as well as a function to get the base table name. So a lot of tools for making uh, easier for you to create some great audit tracking system. I know there's been 25 or 30 or 40, I can't remember the name of, of audit tracking system that actually be built but this is a nice way to be able to actually do it uh, in a different way. Uh, next in the uh, list of uh, enhancements and slash new feature is enhancements we did to the send mail uh, script set that's been there in PharmaCare for a very long time. So previously you could only use uh, either the email client that's on, on the desktop, or you could use the SF SMTP server to be able to actually uh, send email through a PharmaCare solution. But because of the changes that uh, is actually happening with the uh, Microsoft 365 business accounts and the Google Workspace subscriptions, uh, where they are removing the option to do basic authentication, so you won't be able to use that system and use a plain text uh, to send your password, 
we had to implement and be able to give you option to do OAuth 2 authentication through uh, FileMaker. So we've added the option in the send mail option. The information that we actually ask is kind of straightforward. So the FileMaker side of it for once is really straightforward. Uh, everything is using the calculation engine. So you can save the information wherever you want to. The area that's a bit more sort of uh, harder to go through is the work that you have to do to grab all the information that we need from either Microsoft or Google. So essentially, there's a couple of there's a lot of stuff that you have to do. We are working on writing a blog entry to be able to actually sort of give you all the information. There's a couple of partners that have actually written already either how to do it on Google or Microsoft. Uh, we'll put those as well on the community website. Uh, it's depending on your account, it could be really hard or could be kind of straightforward. If you have a basic like Google or Microsoft account, it's kind of straightforward. Sometimes in terms of how your security has been set up, uh, you have to dig down through the option uh, on the website of Microsoft and Google to actually figure it out. But once it's working, you should be fine. If this sounds basically like a lot of technical information that you don't want to stress about, I encourage you to use Claris Connect because with Claris Connect, there's an Outlook uh, connector that actually will take all that pain away really straightforward. Or you could, you could use some other elements inside of Connect that will basically take the pain away uh, really quickly. Uh, the next one that we have is a brand new uh, script step that is actually uh, very similar to one that we had before. So we have currently a script that called Perform Script on Server. It's been there for a couple of uh, versions of FileMaker, really useful. Instead of actually running a script on your local client, you're actually offsetting the information to the FileMaker server. And there was a lot of requests from the community of uh, being able to actually not have to wait for the server to finish running the script, uh, and be able to actually get the server to just tell the client, hey, I'm done with that script, what you want to do. So we created this new perform script on server with callback script step, which is basically going to send, uh, once the script has been run on the server, it's going to inform the client that now it can run the next script, which is the callback script. Um, we had to separate uh, perform script on server and perform script on server with callback so that we could have forward and backward compatibility. There's a few, a few areas that we're working on for new features in that script step, and we don't actually sort of create too much issues for old solutions. So it was actually easier for us to be able to separate the two uh, script steps. Um, and uh, the way, the, so the information, so once the server is actually finished running the script, well, it's basically it's gonna talk back to the client who a, an ID that we save in the background to basically just tell the customer, the, the client, now you can actually roll your uh, callback script. Uh, if you are using a different window, it will basically still send information back. So as long as you're still connected to the server, it's gonna basically uh, run the callback script. If your machine is disconnected for a couple of minutes, like you have the system in the background, it will still know that it's trying to, you're, you're kind of still connected, so basically, as soon as your, your client reconnects without closing the file, it will run the script in the background. If you close the file, it basically will delete any type of information on the callback session, and it's not going to run the callback script one when, when you go back into the system. Uh, so this is the list of all the sort of uh, new features and enhancements we did across, across the board. So we've uh, security is a very important uh, element of the FileMaker platform or the Claris platform or Claris Connect or anything that's part of Apple. So now we have basically across all our product uh, support for OpenSSL 3.0.8. The only one that's not yet there is uh, Ubuntu 20 server. Essentially, it's because Ubuntu 20 came out be before OpenSSL 3.0 is coming out. And so it's still on the latest version of one. But if you want proper security, I, I uh, encourage you to move to the very latest of Ubuntu that we support on the server, which is Ubuntu 22. We've extended the function that we had uh, called read QR code so that now it works properly on FileMaker Pro on Windows and can work as well on FileMaker Server, both on Windows and Ubuntu. We've extended the uh, function get live text to be able to be supported by FileMaker Server. And we've added three new languages, which are Japanese, Korean, and Ukrainian. Uh, we've made some improvements to the uh, generation of PDF thumbnails on Windows. We use a new uh, third-party tool called uh, PDF Yum to make everything kind of work uh, better. And we've done some improvements in how PDF are being handled on Windows. 
There's a few areas where we have still a bit of issues, but we're working on it. And so we'll, we'll, we'll have a, a update of uh, Pharmaco 2023 very shortly that fixes those bugs. We are supporting dark mode now in the relation graph. Uh, we had, uh, we've added the date parent, the date format parameter in the execute Pharmaco data script steps so that you can leverage uh, different types of uh, English local settings and stuff like that. And on top of that, we've about got about 500 sort of bug fixes that we've done since 19.6. Uh, we don't go through the whole list. There is a release notes uh, page on our website, both for server and pro, that will go through the main air, the main bug fixes that we could easily explain and you could easily be able to see in your system. There's a lot of bugs that basically people have never heard of and they, they'll be minor. And if we explain them, it, might get people to be quite scared of something that is actually not important. It could be just something around visual effect or uh, basic bug like this. Uh, one uh, bit of change that we did was actually supporting the new stencil for on Pharmaco Pro. Uh, we hadn't really updated this version for a very long time. So we had a, we've added the new stencil for the latest iPhones, latest iPads, and uh, a larger size on the desktop just to make everyone life a lot easier when they are creating new layouts for uh, their users. So in terms of the specs, uh, we support the last two versions of, of macOS, Bantry and Montry. Uh, we are, we've removed a Big Sur because essentially the computers that can run Monterey can run Big Sur at the same time. And the uh, uh, market share of Big Sur is very low. And so we thought, let's, let's just make sure that we've got Montreal working and Bantry working properly. There's a few still, issues with Ventura, but with the latest update for Ventura, a lot of those aspects are being fixed uh, by the Apple team uh, and not necessarily uh, the Claris team. Uh, on top of that, we support the latest two version of Windows, Windows 11 and Windows 10 uh, on 64-bit. And then uh, we test thoroughly again the latest version that came out uh, a couple of months ago. In terms of the host, so FileMaker Server 2023 product version is 20.1 will be uh, fully working with 19.6, 19.5, and 19.4.2. So if you've got anything earlier than this version, you'll be, you'll basically won't be able to actually get into communicate. So if you can't move straight away to product version 20.1 or product 2023, at least if you move to one of the later version of 19.6, you'll be able to actually sort of uh, get everything to play nicely. Uh, and we'll have soon a Pharmaca Cloud update of uh, uh, Pharmaca 22.20.2. Uh, which will be fully supporting all these new features. Uh, next up on the list is Claris FileMaker. Uh, so we've done some, some work in, since the launch of FileMaker 17 to uh, get everything working through a nice admin console using Node.js in the background so that it was more stable, it was less reliant on Java, and it was less prone to crashes. Uh, FileMaker Server 16 admin console was kind of very busy, had issues where there was too much work being done, it was actually crashing. So we decided to actually sort of do it differently. And one thing we tried, we did as well on top of it was actually have an admin API that worked really nicely so that you could either use the admin console to manage your uh, your FileMaker server or through the admin console, you could manage uh, pretty much the same, the same stuff. One of the things I keep on saying on the FileMaker server is we are trying to make it boring. And when I say boring is once you've actually set it up, once you've created your, you've, you, you, you've, been, you've uh, uploaded your files, you've created your backup schedules, you've created your uh, script schedules, your notification, you've put your certificate, all of the work that you've done, you shouldn't actually have to spend much time on it. The only area where you probably need to go is your log just to check some information, but it should be running and you should be sort of satisfied that once you've actually set it up, you don't actually need to worry but what it's doing, you basically trust that it's doing. So we are working heavily on making sure that we make it a boring app. Once you've installed it, you pretty much don't actually have to worry too much about it. So what we've done is we are making it more performant and more scalable. We've increased the amount of, I'm sorry, the amount of files that you can host on a single FileMaker server. Uh, we went from 125 files to 256. Essentially, it's, it's, it's targeted at everyone but it's more targeted for solution uh, uh, bundle uh, agreement customers. So part of the Claris partner uh, community is made of, of companies that create uh, solutions for companies where they do the hosting for them, they do everything for them, 
And so having more uh, files on a server mean you could actually have more customers on a server. So for the cost for those type of customers, it makes it very easy. But as soon as for larger company, uh, when they have a lot of usage, it's going to be easier for them to actually have more pharmaco file being running on those machines. Uh, the next area where we worked heavily was in the pharmaker web direct area. So we know we have a lot of customers that created once upon a time a pharmaker app on a desktop and it grows and then there's more users in the company. And nowadays there is a trend where people want to basically be able to access the app through a web browser. They don't want to have to actually update any apps. Uh, maybe the machine is not powerful enough or maybe they have people that don't use pharmaker or whatever for not a lot of uh, time during the day. And so having a web-based environment is going to be easier for them. So the work that we did on Pharmaco Web Direct is actually twofold. One of it is to be able to actually have more users be able to connect to one Pharmaco server environment. And at the same time is making it better for customers that actually might not need a thousand, just a hundred, but they need a very stable environment where those hundred customers can connect, not have go sessions, not have any issues. And so we work on both of those sort of angles. So uh, we updated the Java that we use so that it has a lot of bug fixes for Java 11 that we have on the previous version. And it means that we could do a lot of work in the background to make list view work better, to make the CSS caching of the web direct pages be more uh, quicker and more responsive and all that work in the background. So you're gonna see the effect both in on the Mac, on Windows, on Ubuntu. Uh, if you're looking to really get a lot of users on your system, we suggest, we suggest that you use Ubuntu Linux version 22. And on top of that, you can use a load balancer. So we use Nginx. There's a paid version and a free version. That's going to allow you to basically have a very stable system and a lot of people actually using it. And so we've done a lot of work to be able to actually support another version of Ubuntu. So we support the now 20 and we've got version 22. And the 22 version it works both on Intel and ARM processors. So if you're doing hosting using Amazon or any other sort of uh, uh, big uh, providers that offer you the Intel and the ARM uh, options, sometimes ARM options are actually cheaper than Intel. And in a lot of cases, they may actually be more powerful. So there's, it's, a good, uh, it's a good way for you to save money by using those processors uh, in the long run. Uh, we've done some update as well for the Node.js that we use. So we moved to version 18, which means that the API is going to work better and the admin console console is going to be more uh, uh, more responsive to uh, updates of information going through. So the log is going to work better and all the pages will react a lot better. And on top of that, we added two new log uh, entries, one around the script event on the server and the other one around the script engine uh, login. Uh, so this is a couple of uh, screenshots of a Pharmac uh, server running over a thousand uh, connections. Uh, so we do tests where we basically try to get between 1,000 and 1,100. So that way we could basically say that uh, 1,000 people can actually use that property. Uh, and the way we've done that is we've actually opened up a bit more the limits that we actually put in the system before. So we haven't really upgraded how many users you're going to have per, per secondary machine. Uh, the number of connection on Ubuntu, if you have a good machine, will go up to 120. If you have a normal machine, you'll go up to about 100. Uh, but with the way we've done it is uh, we allow you to actually have more secondary machine. So if you do the math, a thousand connection and across the system and a hundred connection per machine means that you're going to need 10 secondary machine to be able to actually get a thousand uh, concurrent connection. So it's not everyone's going to want to do that. We advise that using Docker is going to be the best way for you because it's going to basically not mean that you're spending a fortune on the hardware. And that way you can actually start them up or remove them depending on your needs. Uh, so this is a list basically that well, in the test that we do, we try to sort of test it so that we can get between 110 and 120 uh, connection uh, per, per machine in a stable environment. So we have a software in the background that just basically tests all of that. And we do that for weeks on end just to make sure the system can actually stay up and running. Uh, the next uh, new feature that we have in Pharmac Server is a preview. So it's the V1 of that release. It's going to get better. We are learning from it. Uh, the principle behind it will stay the same, but there might be new extra features that we add uh, uh, over the top. 
So the persistent cache basically is a way to make sure that we uh, can avoid having database corruption when the Farmaker server process crashes. So what it's doing is it's using the uh, cache that you've allotted to your server uh, and it's splitting that into two caches. So we are keeping the old cache, uh, the normal cache that you use in your system uh, when uh, when any sort of type of operation is actually happening on Farmaker. And then we grab the other half to keep that persistent cache. So if you've assigned a, a one gigabyte to your Farmaker server, 512 megabyte will use by, by the persistent cache and 512 by the uh, normal Farmaker cache. But that way, if your Farmaker server crashes, when this, the, the uh, Farmaker server service restarts, it's going to look for that persistent cache and rebuild the file with that data so that you actually don't lose a lot of that, the information that wasn't sort of saved to the data file in last well, five to 10 minutes. If you want more security, there is an option for the persistence cache to be saved on disk. So it's going to move from the RAM to the SSD or the hard disk that you have. That's really good if you potentially have power outage uh, on your system. So there's two ways of actually uh, uh, safeguarding your data. It's going to have a bit of a uh, performance hit because obviously the first action is being done twice. So saving the cache in two areas at the same time. And then if you save it on the disk, you'll have a third basically action occurring. So there's going to be a performance hit. It's roughly a maximum of between two and 5%. Uh, but if you do notice things, you should be aware of the fact that it could be coming from uh, the species in cache. Uh, to be able to actually enable, disable by, de disable by default, you just got to do a quick restart and you can enable it from the admin console, uh, from the CLI or the admin API. Uh, we've done some updates as well on the OData uh, protocol that we support. So now we are supporting uh, 4.0.1. Uh, essentially, the work that has been done is around managing uh, related entities and all the system actually sort of works around it. Uh, it makes it a lot easier for people to be able to actually uh, um, manage data sort of queries in OData. Uh, and uh, if you use OData, it's going to make everything a lot easier for you especially in terms of figuring out whether a record is live. If it basically, it goes away, you, you can get the system to actually recreate entries for you on the fly. So it's really useful for that. Uh, one new feature that we uh, brought along uh, because of all the work that we were doing on WebDirect was we kind of know that, well, it's, it's a known fact that Java has uh, memory uh, problems where sometimes uh, Java doesn't let know how to let go of memory and keeps on growing and growing and growing up to the point that there's not enough memory left and then your, your system kind of dies. And so we created basically two new uh, system scripts that you use from the admin console, whereby you're going to be able to actually remove that memory or reduce the memory footprint that actually Java is using. So um, you can run it directly from, from the admin console. One can be a script step or you can set up a schedule or run it manually. One's going to run on the primary machine if you're only one machine running, and the other one's going to run on the secondary machine if you have secondary machine environment. It re requires uh, JDK 17, and so you'll have to actually install that at the same time as you install it, sort of the Java when you install that. Uh, if you are used, if you upgrading from 19 uh, version, what we'll do is if uh, there's only one version of Java on your machine, the one that's basically inside the Farmaker server, will basically delete the uh, Java 11 information and replace it by Java 17. If you're having a system-wide Java environment running on machine, we'll keep, we'll, we'll not touch the one that's outside of the FileMaker environment. So if you want to run Java 8 or Java 11 in a system, you could be able, you'll be able to actually do that, but we'll still install a JDK 17 uh, inside the FileMaker server so that we can run those garbage collections. There is an uh, engineering blog that talks about uh, all that information and gives information in four, diff in the four different types of a garbage collection that you can do. So the basic one is called G1. It does a normal one. There's a few various sort of uh, different flavors depending on whether you want to do a quick one, a quick sort of removal of uh, all the data or whether you want to do some checks. There's various sort of different ways. I invite you to look at the blog to be able to actually sort of uh, find more information around Java garbage collection. Uh, next one, so it's a preview because we just put it in the system, but it's been something that's been there a lot, for, a lot of time for Windows and Mac users. 
it's the option to be able to use Active Directory external group station inside uh, Ubuntu. Previously, you could only do it through uh, AD file services, uh, which was sometimes a bit sort of harder to do. Now you can use just uh, Active Directory groups uh, easily uh, in your system. So you can enable it through the admin console, and then you'll be able to actually use this group through the console, admin, admin console sign-in, database sign-in, and not the admin roles that we have now in FileMaker 2023. Uh, talking about the backups, so uh, with the later version of 19, we gave you the option to be able to actually do a cancel backup. So you start a backup, it's taking way more time than you imagine. You can click on the button and actually cancel that. Uh, we had requests and a lot of feedback from committee saying, well, we might actually want to keep that cancel backup because there might be a reason and we want to be able to actually track that. There might be that it's taking way too much time, but people need to work. We want to be able to actually keep it. So we give you the option to be able to keep those backups. They will go into the the, uh, the uh, backup uh, slash preserved folder, and you'll be able to actually see them. The naming convention is called canceled with a date and a time when you actually did a backup, and you'll be able to actually sort of go back into it. So this is the list of all the uh, latest features that we basically included in Pharmaca Server 2023. Um, some are sort of minor, like basically the, the, the name limits that we had in schedule was be, before that was uh, 32 characters. And when people are running a lot of script, it was a bit of a page. So we increased that to 100. It, for the Ubuntu uh, 22 and Ubuntu 20, what we've done is when you install it, there is a folder called tools uh, into the Pharmac server that has all the Docker scripts to make it easier for you to install the Dockers. It has as well the Python script to be able to do the um, uh, key authentication to get people to connect to your FileMaker admin console. Uh, we've added as well a support for service PDF on the data API uh, through uh, feedback requests. Uh, we've added as well the option to import pretty much everything from FileMaker Server 16 into FileMaker Server 2023 without anything, uh, without a, any sort of hiccups. Uh, so now you can then import all the admin groups, all the settings that you had, all the, the, the schedules. Uh, and so you should be able to actually make a complete sort of switch from FileMaker Server 16 if you're still using that old version to FileMaker 2023 and everything will be uh, working properly. Uh, I always say with sort of, there might be some issues. If you have any issues, go through customer support. Uh, they'll be able to sort of help you uh, to make sure that everything actually works properly. And then the, the two logs that I mentioned earlier is around script events and the PharmaCus uh, scripting engine, scripting error that could be occurring, which is very useful when you do a lot of perform script on server to be able to actually know if there's any issue uh, with your scripts. Uh, tech specs, uh, so not that massive difference from the pro side. On Mac OS, we support the last two versions. Windows, it will be Windows Server 2022 for the standard versioning and the database, data center edition, and same for Windows Server 2019. On the Ubuntu side, so we'll be supporting Ubuntu 20 and Ubuntu 22. Uh, the uh, ARM version is only supported on Ubuntu 22. Uh, you can use both the server version of Ubuntu or the desktop. Uh, ideally, server is fine, uh, unless you want to basically have a desktop to be able to actually view uh, what the system is doing but it's, it's putting more pressure because it has to run this the, the GUI on top of it. So we kind of advise people, sorry, to actually uh, just use the server version. Uh, so for the clients, so the last four versions basically, so 20.1, 19.6, 19.5, 19.4.2, uh, both on Progo and anything that's created through the iOS app SDK. Now I'm gonna hand over to uh, Ronnie, that's who's gonna talk about Claris Connect. Thanks, Doug. Go ahead and uh, share my screen over here. And I've only got three slides, but I think they're really good. So just bear with me. All right. So let's start by giving away some free stuff. So we, with the launch of FileMaker 2023, we've actually introduced a free tier of Claris Connect. 
So now we've got no excuse of not using Claris Connect yeah, if you uh, don't have an account. So we really want to make sure that everybody in the Claris community has the opportunity to integrate their solutions with the rest of the world. So by eliminating this barrier to uh, use Claris Connect, we want to make sure that everybody uh, is able to really enjoy the, the benefits of integrating uh, using the, the, the Claris Connect. And you know, we've done a lot of effort. We're we're really working, we're working really hard into making sure that all the products of the Claris platform talk well with one one another. So we provide a real co coherent experience uh, across the entire platform. And while we've had a uh, we've had FileMaker connectors in Claris Connect from the very beginning, uh, you know, we started asking well uh, some of our users. What is the kind of biggest challenge you have when integrating FileMaker with Claris Connect? And a lot of people came back saying the same thing. Well, triggering a flow from FileMaker uh, takes several steps, and, and it's not the, the the best experience. We went back and said, "Well, let's let's look and see what we can do to make this better." And so I'm really happy to say that with the launch of FileMaker 2023, we're introducing a new script step that's specifically designed to trigger. Claris Connect flows. And it's aptly named trigger Claris Connect flow. So the script step uh, really helps out to that, uh, being able to uh, get that, that transition or that, that, that integration between FileMaker and Claris Connect. This is actually a, a script from one of our partners doing an integration from FileMaker to an API in the, let's say the traditional sense, right? Using insert from URL script step, handling the authentication, like doing everything within the script. And the tools are there and they work really, really well. But we all know that it can get fairly complex. And so he had run an experiment where he take, take this uh, script and transition it over to Claris Connect. And he saw a huge reduction in the complexity of the script because he's able to offload uh, all those things that he would manually have to do, um, like the authentication, uh, I like the calling, uh, dealing with errors and, and all those things and offload those to Claris Connect, especially using the new script step allows them to make it a, a lot easier and simplify this entire process. So I'm going to take uh, a couple of minutes here to show you, try to show you what this looks like. Uh, it's live, so bear with me. <laughs> so I'm here at Claris Connect. I've got already a, a flow here, and this is my, my trigger. And if you uh, look at the trigger, give you here the uh, the instructions that it would take you pre FileMaker 2023 on how to uh, call this from FileMaker uh, FileMaker Pro. So the normal operations you use insert from URL script step. You have to configure the curl options. You call this particular URL, and you have to send a JSON attribute right in with a specific piece of data in there. And so there's several steps, and any error in in these steps, well, it doesn't work. So we're still going to use a URL. I'm just going to copy this URL and I'm going to move over here to uh, copy FileMaker. I've got a script already going over here and I'm going to start typing here to find my new script step trigger Claris FileMaker flow. Now I'm going to hit return and we'll notice that it immediately took in that URL. So it knows that there's a URL in, in the clipboard and it automatically places in there in the right place. So you don't even have to do that. So we'll figure, figure that out for you and taking that step away from you. The next thing is that in the traditional way, using insert from URL script step, you have to send again that, that special object along with your data. So we took that away. You don't have to configure curl options or anything like that. And we actually have a specific parameter here called JSON data. And when you click on it, you get your familiar uh, calculation engine. So you can put here anything you want. Um, you can write a JSON here directly. Uh, it can be uh, completely um, static strings if you want to, but right, you'd probably want to want to use the uh, built-in JSON functions in, in FileMaker. So you can use those to create your JSON object. And uh, directly from over here, if you're calling this, this uh, new script step not only works with the script, uh, with this trigger from the FileMaker connector, but it also works with webhooks. So if you have webhooks uh, configured with API key, you have a parameter here specifically for that. So you can use that. And you can even choose where the target or the response is going to be saved, whether in a field or in a variable of your choosing, very similar to the insert from URL script step. All right, I'm going to save this. I'm going to leave it as that. I'm going to save this over here. And I'm going to go back over here and add something here to this flow. Maybe we want to let everybody know on Slack 
Um, we want to make an announcement. We'll choose choose a channel, and then what we'll do is we'll take data from uh, FileMaker payload. We'll send it over here, and we'll use that and save it on there. So I'll just enable this. We'll go back here to FileMaker and run the script. And sure enough, bring up here Slack, and you see it automatically. Uh, send the information over to the Slack, you select a API with the, with the payload that came from FileMaker. So as easy as that, you can start integrating your FileMaker solutions with uh, Claris Connect and we're uh, making it a lot easier for you. This is our first step with it. Uh, we're going to continue making improvements to it and uh, make sure that you have a much better experience between our products. But with that, uh, I'm going to stop here and uh, send it back here to Doug. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Rene. Uh, so I've got one more slide. Uh, so John mentioned it at, at the uh, offset. Uh, there is a Claris Engage uh, next year in February 6 to the 8th. We'll be in uh, Texas, in Austin. Uh, once we have dates of uh, for the booking of the hotels, for the other stuff, we'll send that. It should be uh, very soon. Uh, but we're looking forward to actually see uh, see all of you. Um, the other thing is, if you go on our website uh, in the uh, Clarice Engage part, you'll be able to actually see all the conferences that are actually being already sort of put together by uh, developers uh, across the world. I think there's about six or seven currently, uh, all run from Australia, Europe, uh, and in the US. So it will be nice to get people to see them face to face uh, again after four or five years of uh, doing them. <laughs>